Global trade tensions and tariffs have certainly taken a toll on many industrial companies like Linamar that manufactures auto parts as well as other heavy equipment. Looking at Linamar's stock, you can see it's been a pretty tough ride for investors over the past couple of years since a peak back in 2015. For more on the company and the global trade headwinds facing Linamar, we're now joined by the CEO, Linda Hasenfratz. Linda, nice to see you today. Thanks very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Um, I want to first get your take in terms of what you are currently seeing today as it relates to the trade tensions and tariff tensions, specifically given the fact that it seems as though there's been a bit of a changing tone just over the past couple of weeks. Have you seen that translate into any type of better business sentiment? Yeah, I think it's uh, early days for it to start to affect sentiment. Uh, I think uh, it does feel like there's a bit of positive momentum building, which is great. Uh, so hopefully we'll start to see uh, things get resolved and then people can feel a little more comfortable that uh, these issues are behind us. I do believe that they will get resolved sooner than later. Of course, though, the, the time has really impacted business sentiment, business investment, um, specifically mm -hmm. even surrounding farmers that have, has impacted um, some of your equipment business. Um, what, what kind of, uh, if you can put it into context for us, what kind of impact have you been seeing and, and continue to see? Yeah, so we have three key businesses that we focus on, automotive, and uh, agricultural equipment and access equipment uh, through our Skyjack uh, business. I would say the tariffs are mostly impacting our industrial businesses, so Skyjack and Macdon, the harvesting equipment. Uh, as you point out, farmers are feeling the pinch uh, on the tariff side. Uh, we're feeling it here in Canada as well for related uh, reasons, and as a result, the agricultural market's down quite a bit. Uh, the access market is also down, I think related uh, also to tariffs and business sentiment. Uh, the automotive industry is soft, uh, but really for uh, different reasons, I'm going to say. I mean, definitely there's some um, uncertainty economically, which I think is, is stopping people from heading out to, uh, to buy a car. Uh, but we're sort of three years into that uh, in terms of the uh, the down cycle here in North America. So uh, hopeful actually that uh, we're going to start to see a little bit higher volumes next year on the auto side, which of course is the biggest part of our business. So the softness that we have seen in the auto cycle, do you, do you feel it's almost stabilizing here at these lower levels? Well, I think that, uh, you know, 2019 has been a little bit worse than anybody expected, probably in no small part due to the GM strike, which took a lot of units out of production this year. Uh, if you look globally as well, uh, it's been a tough year, particularly in Asia, uh, for instance, in China. Uh, but the expectation is for things to start to improve next year and overall global volumes to be up a bit and volumes here in North America uh, to be up a little bit as well. So I do feel like uh, we're, we're starting to see the light at, at the end of the tunnel there, which I think is uh, really important. Mm -hmm. And I think importantly for us as well, we're taking advantage of this time frame to really build market share, to win new business. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, our, if you look at uh, global vehicle volume production was down a little over 3%, 3.5% in the third quarter. Our automotive uh, segment sales were up a half a percent. So a great, great indication of the growth that we're seeing in terms of new market share. And at the same time, you know, there's some troubled suppliers out there having a tough time, particularly in Europe, where things have been a little rougher for the last year. Uh, and we've actually won more than $200 million of takeover business from those suppliers who are going out of business. So, you know, it's a little bit of a, a, the, the uh, silver lining uh, on the cloud of, uh, of the, the downturn. Mm -hmm. um, but we are taking advantage to, uh, to grab that business. So when things do start to pick up, our sales will uh, really shoot up. Linda, that's interesting. So you've actually taken market share in Europe because of the difficulties in the European economy hitting and impacting some of your competitors. So, and the reason why I'm asking that is Correct. because some, sometimes there's been some view on, on your balance sheet in terms of kind of taking a look at the strength or weakness of, of your balance sheet and the debt. Um, obviously, it sounds as though the company's position is strong enough to go into those markets and have enough confidence to go into those markets and take market share. 
Yeah, absolutely. And furthermore, I would say our balance sheet is actually pretty strong. I mean, our net debt to EBITDA is about 1.7-ish. Uh, I think that's actually pretty good. There's a lot of companies who have a heck of a lot more uh, more debt than that. So uh, it's a little more than we would normally carry, Just, but we're quite conservative when it comes to uh, debt compared to a lot of folks out there. So uh, we absolutely have the ability to go after that work and we're aggressively doing so. Uh, mm -hmm. We have always done this through downturns and it's always paid back for us when things start to uh, pick back up. It pays off now as well, it helps to offset uh, declining uh, volumes or give us a little bit of growth when volumes are flat. Mm -hmm. um, outside of Europe and the weakness that we've seen there, what other geographies around the world, perhaps, I don't know, I mean, obviously I don't think it was a surprise that there's so much weakness in Europe, but is there anything that's a little bit surprising to you as you look around the, the various global economies? I wouldn't say that there's anything really surprising, although, uh, I mean, certainly we've seen a lot of softness uh, in China. Uh, on the auto side, it's been a tough year uh, for China, but uh, I do think things are starting to stabilize uh, there as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think it was a surprise, but mm -hmm. it is a, an area of weakness. Uh, Linda, let's bring it home to Canada and, and what you're seeing here in Canada from an economic perspective. Um, and, and certainly, you know, mm -hmm. of course, we, we talk a lot on BNN Bloomberg about the, uh, the issues and the debates uh, from provinces to provinces across Canada and the issues there, the East versus the West. Um, what are you seeing as the political headwinds perhaps impacting business or business sentiment here in Canada? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously it does have some impact uh, in, in terms of sentiment, but, you know, I really think that we've got so many huge positives going on that although I agree that the issues with, uh, you know, the resource sector not being able to make investment in, in an easy way and some of the lack of, you know, policy and, and uh, focus around those, those projects is all-consuming from a headline perspective. In fact, there's so many fantastic things going on here in this country, in no small part in our sector in advanced manufacturing where you know, we're taking this deep manufacturing expertise that we have in this country and mirroring it up with the fantastic technology sector and everything that's being developed there, uh, whether it's uh, you know, through all kinds of new technologies, also AI and machine learning and how that can make us more efficient and, and uh, not just in product, design but also in process and how we do things and uh, I think there's a massive opportunity in the advanced manufacturing sector in Canada that uh, should take up a little more of the headlines. That's probably true. I suppose at the end of the day, though, um, how, how, how do you see that impacting business decisions? Because it seems as though there's been a real lack of business investment in Canada for the past decade or so. I mean, obviously, there's different aspects to that. But, but, um, mm. but what, what's your view right now in terms of how willing CEOs are to, to go and spend money? I think it depends on the sector, obviously. I mean, I look at our own experience. We, we spent more money on new capital in Canada last year than we ever have in our history. So it's certainly not impacting us from investing in our Canadian operations. We see huge opportunity. Our operations in Canada are our most productive globally. We have been winning significant amounts of new business. We have a huge amount of business that we're launching, and that takes investment. So we are actively, heavily investing in our Canadian operations, and I know other people are doing the same thing. Uh, Linda, from a stockholder perspective, though, a shareholder perspective, um, the stock is down by about 50% since its uh, June 2015 peak. What's your message to shareholders, long-term shareholders? Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly frustrating. There's no uh, bigger or longer term shareholder than myself. Uh, so uh, believe me, we're frustrated by where the share price is performing. But uh, I think a lot of it is to do with this sort of end of cycle, auto cycle. We've, uh, we're in the third year of a downturn in North America. Uh, investors don't like that. And it doesn't matter how much you're performing. I mean, even though this is the third year of a downturn in the last two years, we still managed to pull off double digit earnings growth. So mm. our EPS just keeps, you know, just kept going up and our, even at the same time as our share price is going down. So, you know, it's very much related to the auto cycle and the fact that we should see things uh, starting to pick up next year should be a plus 
uh, for the stock to start to uh, perform again. Uh, Linda, from um, the Trudeau government uh, set to unveil their cabinet this week, what do you want to see within the cabinet? What kind of policies, any changes that you might want to see that you think will help not only your sector, of course, but, um, but the business environment? We've seen a lot of capital outflows. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to see this time around? Well, I'd like to see a continued focus on innovation. I think that's been uh, a very a big positive for a variety of sectors. Uh, the only way that we compete is by being innovative, and being innovative means spending money, whether it's on R&D or new capital to take advantage of new technology. So whatever our governments can be doing to support that, I think, is really positive. Uh, I certainly think that we should be looking at tax policy, uh, both in terms of simplifying, but also in terms of making sure we're competitive. Uh, I think that uh, the Does fact that the U.S. reduced their tax rate and we did not put us at a disadvantage, and we do need to understand that and uh, and look at that. Um, you does, know, does that mean you want to uh, see I a lower? Regular does that mean we need? Does, does that mean we need a lower corporate tax rate in Canada? Yes, yes, it does. In order to compete again with uh, with the U.S. We used to have an advantage and it's important to have an advantage when you're the smaller pet player uh, on the board. So uh, it's important, I think, to restore that advantage. All right. Linda, we'll leave it there. Great to catch up with you today. Thank you. You too. Thanks so much. Thank you. That is Linda Hasenfratt, CEO of Linamar.